Last month we, uh, we celebrated an anniversary of sorts, not necessarily a positive one. Um, we celebrated September 11th and the events that happened some 13 years ago now. Seems hard to believe. And uh, in the years since September 11th, we have uh, heard lots of stories. We have uh, heard stories of heroes. We've heard stories of spouses and of children left behind. We've heard stories of miraculous rescues and survivor stories. And I came across a story as I was uh, reading last month that seems especially pertinent to me today as we get ready to celebrate World Communion Sunday. It seems a young man was in his 20s and he lived through the terror of being in the World Trade Center on the day that the Twin Towers came down. In fact, he was on the 47th floor and when the people were told to stay, his youth and his instincts told him otherwise. And so he ran down some 47 flights of stairs to safety. Now it would seem natural that this man would be uh, struck with a sense of survivor's guilt, maybe. He survived when so many others that day did not. But as it turns out, that was not the struggle that the young man faced in the weeks and the months and the years that followed that event. So what was his problem, you ask? Well, it was this. He was unable to get out of his mind the scene that he left behind. People of all ages and races and genders and nationalities praying, some of them in languages that he could not even understand. In, in postures of prayer with which he was unfamiliar. And all of them were praying to the same God. He later asked his pastor, and what am I to make of that, pastor? Suddenly, my God seemed so embarrassingly narrow. As I was running down those stairs that day, I couldn't help but think of the God who is claimed by all of the people that I passed. Well, you know what, friends? That young man just encountered in that story the one family that Jesus calls us to. He had a vision that day of God's intent for humanity, a distinct expression of faith. There's one message, one God, one flock, one shepherd, and one hope. And he understood in that moment that God's intent for humanity is that we should all be one people. And you know, that's the essence of what it is that we celebrate on World Communion Sunday. The fact that though we are many, and though we are diverse, though we live in different countries and we speak different languages and we even pray in different ways, we're all one family, one body, one in Christ Jesus. And yet, don't we often have great trouble comprehending that? It's kind of hard to wrap your head around a God-sized vision of a world where all humanity is one people, peaceful and united. And I think at the core, each of us suffers in some way the same problem that that young 9-11 survivor did. Our God is too narrow. You see, without even thinking about it, and with no bad intentions, in our lives, God is a he. <coughs> and God is white. <coughs> and God is United Methodist. <laughs> or at least Protestant. God is American. And the list could go on and on, couldn't it? And so we often forget that the creator of us all, God, is God for all. Why, God is the God of the Coptic Christians who live in Ethiopia. God is the God of the Catholics in Rome and across the street. 
the Baptists down the street. Men, women, children all around the world, even, heaven forbid, Muslims and Jews. The God we love, the God who is the Father of Jesus Christ, is the God for all people, all ages and nations and genders. And on this day, we celebrate our God and his really big vision of the world. Because we are reminded that in our union with Christians around the world, we anticipate that day when all of humanity will be united, even as Christians are united even now, around a table. You know, in his first letter to the church in Corinth, a portion of which Teg read this morning, the Apostle Paul stops to explain to that new Christian community that more than anything else, the bread and the cup shared in communion is symbolic of the way and the unity as the family of Christ. Because for Paul, participation in the Lord's Supper is the fundamental defining act of the believing community. For Paul, that participation, like no other activity, this shared meal clearly embodies each believer's relationship to Christ and to one another with pristine clarity. At the crux of Paul's argument is that those who sit at the Messiah's table share in his life. The life that is the human embodiment of the one true God. And because there is one loaf, and because all believers share in that one loaf, they, though many, are one body. And this means that the Lord's Supper is not, nor can it ever be, just another meal. It's not just another get-together of believers. For Paul, this meal is the definitive action that stands at the very heart of our faith. You all know the importance of shared meals, right? I remember evening meals with my parents and my brothers. Now, as I remember it, the news was almost always on somewhere nearby. And at a young age, I was pretty convinced that that was really boring. But it led to a lot of conversations. The dinner table is where we shared about our days and we listened to one another uninterrupted. Well, as interrupted as three young boys around the table can be. It's where I learned about current events, about politics, and about appropriate table etiquette. Did you know it's not appropriate table etiquette to blow the crumbs of a saltine cracker at a dinner table? I learned that at a dinner table. And ever since I was a little kid, this one holiday called Thanksgiving has been probably my most favorite holiday because that's when our whole family gets together now, around the table, and we make so many wonderful memories, many of which involve laughing so hard that we're almost crying there around the table. And yet, despite all those wonderful experiences, so many of us have shared around a table like that, we have lost an appreciation for the importance of eating around a dinner table in our culture. You know, in Paul's day, sharing table, dinner with someone, was the primary social symbol of acceptance, of belonging, and of mutuality. A symbol which unfortunately has kind of faded in the ensuing millennia now. We barely even pause to eat at the same time anymore in most families, much less share meals with families and friends. I read a, some statistics not long ago. Um, it seems for children and teens, having dinner with parents or members of their family is a pretty good predictor of strong academic success, of psychological adjustment, of lower rates of alcohol abuse and drug abuse, of early sexual behavior, of eating disorders, and of the risk of suicide. And yet, polls show at the same time that families today spend one-third less time around a dinner table than they did 
40 years ago. And most of us, well, we would probably be forced to agree with that. Seems whether we're married or whether we're single, whether we're with families or without, we spend more time, folks, sitting in drive-ins, waiting for food to be prepared and slid out a window to us, than we do sitting at table fellowship with our family and friends. College students, they run from one class to another, munching on a slice of pizza during the 10-minute transition time between classes. Or maybe we pause for a few minutes at the end of our school days and the beginning of that frantic evening rush to get their homework done and they grab something to eat really quick. If those tattered shreds are all that's left of our meal times, then what has become of our view of Holy Communion? Despite the centrality that Paul and so many others have placed on the practice of Holy Communion in the lives of believers, I don't necessarily think that we view it often that way in our own lives. And Paul, you know, he picked up on that as he looked at the church in Corinth. He saw that the Lord's Supper didn't hold any greater significance among the lives of young Christians than the sacrifices that they, and in some cases, even still were making at the altars of pagan gods. We might not make sacrifices at pagan altars, but the significance of the Lord's Supper, it seems to me, has been lost in other ways. Why, month after month, we come to the Lord's table and we eat a bread and drink from a cup. But you know, what does it really mean to us? Well, just in case you see the district superintendent or the bishop anytime soon, you can make sure they know that I told you that John Wesley taught us that the Lord's Supper is a means of grace. It's a special way, Wesley taught, in which we experience God's grace in our lives. And yet, as we receive the bread of life and we drink the cup of forgiveness, how often do we pause and do we reflect? And do we allow the full meaning of that to sink in in some special way as we receive the meal? Or do we just take it for granted? Like we do with so many other things in our life. God's grace is an amazing and powerful thing. It draws us into God's presence, even when we're not aware of it. When we call upon God with our penitent hearts, it's God's grace that forgives us and begins the process of making us new. And through the Lord's Supper, we are, in essence, taking God's grace into us in a tangible way. Have you ever experienced communion in that way? Do you ever walk away from this table feeling refreshed and restored and renewed? And then, you know, there's this whole unity thing. Because Paul teaches that because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one loaf. Monthly, weekly, even daily, Christians around the world partake in the sacrament of Holy Communion. Now, some might use crackers, and others might use wine. Some might kneel to receive the bread and the cup. Some might drink from the cup, call it common cup, while others drink from tiny individual cups. The bread might be dipped in the juice. There may be singing. There may be special prayers. It may be called a sacrament or a memorial meal or the Eucharist or the love feast. But people coming to the table, friends, they are both saints and sinners. They might be brown or black or white. They might be gay or straight. They might be Republican or Democrat. They might be young or old. They might be male or female. They might be any of the other flavors of God's family that you can think of, but they are all one in Christ Jesus. We are all one in Christ Jesus. Our sharing of the common loaf is a common meal. That's what Paul says, and he says that it signifies our unity in Christ above all. And that is what World Communion Day is really all about. 
But you know, friends, World Communion <coughs> Sunday and the Lord's Supper mean nothing to us if we don't pause to take God's grace into the world and to promote unity beyond this table. We all know how easy it is in our modern society to divide, right? It's the easiest thing to go on. We know how easy it is to hate and to bully, to separate ourselves and to point out other people as those others. By our time here at the Lord's table, well, we're called to remember that we live according to a different way. A way that's supposed to rise above all that hatred and division. A way of peace and unity. A way of grace and love that reflects the very love of Jesus Christ himself. This shared meal, the very embodiment of Jesus' own sacrifice for us, is at the essence of who we are as Christ followers. So this morning, and I pray every morning, as you come to the table, as we share in this meal today with Christians all around the world, come ready to experience God's grace. And allow that grace to wipe away all of your feelings of otherness or division. Maybe you'll want to pause at the communion rail after you receive communion this morning. And let that grace just flow from you. And let that grace mold you. And shape you. And unite you. Unite us all as one in the body of Christ.